Faz. Ai, tô... yes, eu estou fazendo a apresentação, eu vou, 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 vou já sim. chamar o Mark. Não, pode ser? Não, sim, podes, podes, podes convidá-lo. Mas se calhar era bom só dizermos como a conversa vai ser em inglês. Sim, só sim, porque sim, depois sim. nós vamos partilhar isto. Uh, então nós temos como convidado o Mark Leiber, uh, que é um agricultor que está assediado no Alentejo. Uh, e é quem fundou o Visionário da Quinta das Abelhas, que é um projeto de agrofloresta uh, que tem o apoio da agenda GUST, Gust uh, do Ernest Gust, que é um pioneiro da floresta, que é o pioneiro da floresta sintrópica. Um, este projeto fica na herdade do Fecho do Meio, que é um, um espaço também muito interessante para quem não o conhece. Um, e... A Quinta das Abelhas foi um dos projetos que nós apoiámos uh, com os fundos angariados na nossa campanha a um Milhão de Pessoas, Uma Floresta. Um, e pronto, e tem sido assim que nós estamos a reiniciar estas nossas conversas, é convidando os três projetos que, que nós apoiámos. Um, a conversa vai ser em inglês, por isso espero que nos possam acompanhar na mesma. E pronto, e agora acho que vamos conseguir convidar o Mark. Ok. Juntar-se a nós. Hi, Mark. Olá. 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 Sorry. Uh, vamos falar. In... We are going to speak in English uh, okay. today. Juice. That's. Uh, um, so yeah, we had a, a few technical issues, but I hope you are well. You seem well. Uh, you have sun on your yeah. skin. Yeah. So that's already a great start. I did a small introduction to you, but very, very small. I was so, listening. Sorry? I was you listening. Were listening? Yeah. <laughs> so Just because small. our conversation usually is in Portuguese, but now we're deciding that we're going to do it in both languages. So I mean, we're saying. And I can also speak uh, Portuguese if it's easier for the audience. Uh, no. It's, I think it's the same. We'll be, we're going to ha have people in Portuguese and in English. Yeah. Okay. Let's try. Yeah. Okay. So um, okay. we could start by, you know, like just asking you what is Quinta das Abelhas, uh, a farm for the bees, and also why Portugal, right? Like why you are in the Lintage? So um, can, well, I'll start with the second question. So um, I am an agronomist by education and during my studies in conventional agriculture I started having lots of questions to the contemporary paradigms of agriculture um, or about the contemporary paradigms of agriculture towards my teachers and a lot of these questions they could not answer and um, as a result of this I got together with the group of other people that were in different classes in uh, the same university. We understood each other and had a similar vision for sustainable agriculture. And um, together, we then created a project to make agroforestry close to our university to invite our teachers to participate, to show them that really it would be possible to work together with nature and still do agriculture, which they thought was a ridiculous concept. And uh, then we also um, wanted to invite other students of ours to inspire them as well. And uh, we made this project and it's still going. It's now a seven-year-old agroforestry system there in the Netherlands that's taken care of by other individuals there from the region. And in this whole process, I got to know Ernst Götsch. And uh, he was really a person that, as you already said, uh, he has probably been one of the most significant individuals within my whole um yeah how do you say um education in sustainable agriculture and agroforestry mm -hmm. and um when i was with him he started working here in adan do fresh do meio when i was in brazil in his farm and he was telling me so many good things about it and at the same time when he started talking that he would come here i was always hoping that they would call me to come and help here and then whenever he came here he came back to brazil and said so many good things about fresh do meio and that i should get to know it that it made me want to come even more but even more than that already during 
in the time in the Netherlands when I was making this food forest with my friends, I always had the like an inner voice telling me that I would end up in Portugal and have a farm there. And uh, then eventually the invitation came for me to do an internship here in Freixo do Meio. And um, which, uh, yeah, then during the realization of that, I... Um, Sorry, um, was, this, was that before going to Brazil? I went to before. Brazil two times to stay with Ernst. It was after my first... So I went there once in 2019 to Brazil. No, it was in 2018. And then in the beginning of 2019, I had the internship here in Freixo do Meio. And then I went again to Brazil. And then from Brazil, I came directly here with uh, all the inspiration from Ernst Farm to start immediately here, my own project. When did you, so when did you start your project in, in Alentejo? When... In the end of 2019. Oh, okay. So the same year. So now mm -hmm. four years ago. Four years, yeah. So how has it been? So tell us about the... <laughs> well, so Quinta das Abelhas, um, it, the whole idea behind it is to create a space here within Portugal where I myself can put into practice the things that I learned uh, during my time with Ernst, but also where I can work together with him to understand how does Centropic farming apply here in the Mediterranean concept, context or how do his principles of agriculture apply here in the Mediterranean context and um, it's kind of like a case study for me where I myself can experiment and I can invite other people to participate in this whole process and um, so yes um, for me in that sense it's a very important uh, thing because before um, yeah, I really wanted to practice myself what I've learned from him. And this is what I do here. It ha the farm has three main objectives. The first one is to recreate a um, healthy Mediterranean forest mm -hmm. that um, produces also food and fruits for people. And at the same time, hosts and creates a kind of oasis for a number of pollinating insects, hence the name Quinta das Abelhas but also um, seed dispersing birds and other uh, animals, including humans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> lastly, to, to test, to apply and test as much as I can principles of agriculture developed by Ernst Koch. So um, trying to work together with him on developing different, sorry. Mm -hmm. Uh, working together with him to develop different test fields and um, creating different conditions for the plants in each individual situation to see how the plants adapt and what combinations of species really do work here in this region. And then from there, my main objective is to bring the whole concept to scale, to create a scalable model. Do you feel it? There's a lot of experimentation from you um, comparing to the project in Brazil. So like you and, and Ernest are still like, um, because you still collaborate with him. Yes. No? So um, do you feel there's a lot of experimentation because it's, it's here, in, it's south of Portugal and the, the, the weather is different and everything is different or there's a lot of uh, things you already know and um, are similar to Brazil in a way? Well, I think that uh, it's impossible to say that I'm doing more experimentation here than Ernst had to do in Brazil to get to these concepts. I know for a fact that he worked a lot more and did a lot more research, especially in a much more scientific way than I am doing to get to the conclusions that brought him to create these principles for agriculture. And so this kind of already created a base for uh, his students, the people that are inspired by him, which include me, to, so he was able to already structure his results and give them to us in a way that we can apply them. And of course, you know, like there's things that you only understand after doing them yourselves. So you have to make some certain, like, and this depends on the individual, 
like uh, some people understand some things without having to make it as a mistake first others uh, other mm -hmm. things so of course there is some experimentation here but the principles are already founded so it is also you know um i don't think i work as experimentally as ernst did in the beginning i was wondering because of ge geographic uh difference if it mm. had uh, if it had in the end also a different practice that you had to just uh adapt no yeah um I mean, uh, like, the main thing that I have to find out, the principles and the whole idea is really the same. There is just, the species are different. I need to use other plants. And this has been kind of the search to try to figure out which are these plants. And also, the um, one thing that is uh, different here in the Mediterranean and temperate climate is that the seasons are completely different, which affect a lot the way that the plants grow and also how the forest develops over the years and things that that permits you to do. Yeah. Which also like brings me to the one of the thoughts I've been having, which is mm. with the ch changes that are happening uh, mm. at the moment and uh, the soils being kept more and more dry and the erosion of the soils and the change mm. of the climate, I imagine you have how does how does that like your project see those challenges going ahead and I imagine some species you tell me I don't know anything about it but you know like species that normally would be um, already uh, regular in that region they might not be you know they have to adapt differently mm. do you have do you see what i'm saying like this does that that vision that things are getting a bit more confusing also in weather in seasons how has that been to you in your project and your vision um i mean there are certain things that of course uh the mediterranean climate has always been a climate that's very unpredictable uh, and that already dates back thousands of years. I mean, you can look back in historic accounts from the Egyptians, the Greeks, the Phoenicians, the Romans, the list goes on. Uh, also in the Bible, there's always been periods of droughts where people had to dislocate themselves, go look for other places where they could not grow their food. And so I think that's just part of the reality of this climate in itself. And... Um, you know, like I have found here in my own farm that I have been able to establish plants that people did not believe that would grow here in this area uh, with very little irrigation because they said they would need more water or these kind of things. But because I give a lot of care to the plants and I give them a protected environment to grow up in, so they are protected by a number of other species that surround them, I can, it allows me to, even in uh, bad years, have the plants established well without me needing to irrigate them so much, you know. We can see that difference every time we went there. Mm. Uh, I, think, I think we went there like three times or something mm. and every time it's a huge difference. So uh, no. I can imagine this whole uh, system between the plants growing and growing and uh and also with the soil i think also it's it, it, you can feel the difference also in the soil how do you relate the this project that you're doing there the agroforest and everything with the other part of research that you were speaking in the it's also related to um to something that we wanted to uh, speak with you that is your workshop that you do these next months i i didn't understand quite your Sorry. question like what other uh, research do you mean uh, uh besides besides growing the agroforest forest there mm -hmm. you're doing one of the, the the things of your project is research also 
So yeah. I think it's related also to the workshops you're doing, and that's what I wanted to sp uh, to ask you: mm -hmm. how these workshops relate to the agroforest or the Quinta das Abelhas project? Well, uh, the research and the workshops there are two different subjects. The research is something that right now is not actively happening because I myself, I'm limited in what I can do and uh, or what I give my priorities to. And um, so right now, you know, like I'm waiting or looking to have the right conditions to have interns from universities here that can make real research assignments where there have already been two, but it's not been like never really a research more like a um, account of what is here so that other people could later on do research um the other question about the workshops for me the workshops is a really important way of sharing what i have found as a result of my work here and also to pass on the inspiration that i attained and gained by living with ernst for uh, those months and for having been in contact with him all of these years where I can pass that knowledge and this inspiration on to other people or at least attempt to <laughs> and um, so for me it's just really it's about bringing this to a scale you know because um, I think that really in order to um, to do this on a larger scale it's not just that we need different machines or tractors that can do these things but it's also to sensibilize more people towards these ideas and that they have impactful experiences within these uh within this field because it's difficult for somebody that has lived here in a place like this or in Arn's farm for three or four or five or six months to forget an experience like that because it's a completely different environment from what people nowadays are used to. Mm -hmm. And um, I think this is something that is like this impact in people is something that uh, I think is very important to me and this project. And what kind of, so is it open to everyone? Uh, what is the, uh, is it open to anyone? Can, can anyone apply to this uh, workshop? Um, yes, so um, you in, have uh, one soon, right? You have one in, now in October. Exactly. Yeah. From October the 27th until October the 31st, I will host a group of around 20 people here and uh, the registrations are open to anybody. Mm -hmm. It is a paid workshop, um, which then, you know, it helps me to fund the research and all the work that I'm doing here. And um, also, of course, there's uh, costs associated to actually organizing the workshop. And um, so the workshops are, yeah, uh, as I said, they're open to anybody to register. There's a limited amount of participants. Mm -hmm. And I usually uh, have always asked for a um, motivational letter so I can understand the person's intentions behind coming to the workshop because uh, to me it's also always important to gather let's say the right uh, group of people like to have a harmonious group with that uh, where there's different individuals that balance each other nice nice so the ways to reach out your your website and or your instagram to, to do yeah that. so um i mean i know it's not the ideal way <laughs> for everybody but the way that I have been advertising my workshops is through my Instagram page. And uh, there's a link in my biography where you can follow it and make an inscription to the workshop. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and they are usually for five days. It's not... Uh, five days. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, um, in terms of like the social and community, like the... Um, the feedback of, you know, your surrounding community um, and mm. peers, um, um, not only like local uh, uh, um, farmers, but also the, the community around um, 
uh, around Herdade de Sabalhas? How has been it? Do you feel like there is an increase in interest? Um, how is your relationship? Does you, do you feel like there is a, a, a um, exchange of knowledge happening? How has it been, that experience? Yeah, um, I think that in the beginning, I remember in the very first year that I was here, there was a lot of interest from a lot of people to come and visit and see it. And I, within the first summer, I had a really a ridiculous amount of people come here. It was every day at least three to five people within the first summer that would come to visit the farm. And um, from that experience, you know, in the beginning, I loved sharing everything so much. But then I also realized that I couldn't do that every day. And uh, then also from my side, I started limiting a bit the amount of people that I could receive here because in the meantime, I also, this is my home. It's not just my farm, but it's my home. And um, so that has made it, um, you know, sometimes, uh, and also with the workload and everything challenging to accept or receive people every time that somebody would like to come visit. But, um, yeah, I think the interest has been very big and every time that people come here, it does uh, impact them in a certain way. To see a landscape in the middle of the Alentejo that's completely green <laughs> in the middle of summer. And uh, I mean, you have seen it the last time more than a year ago and really within that last year, it has changed a lot. Yeah, um, yeah it's impressive. You, you've been sharing some um, drone footage and it's really nice to see that. Um, no. I, I I recommend to, to watch it because it's, yeah, it's right. Because by now it's not only green above, mm -hmm. but everything in the floor is also green. So yeah. it's just comp like green on all levels, uh, all year round. And that has always been my goal. And now it seems to be like that. Now in terms of the neighboring people, there was, you know, people that always believed in what I wanted to do. And, um, also, they are, I think they uh, respected a lot because they see how much work and dedication I've put into all of this. And um, the fact that, you know, I didn't just do it for two years and then I stopped, but that I continue having the same passion and drive to continue every year doing more and more and more. And actually, it's just increasing. <laughs> and um, the other part of the people were uh, like the curious ones, which are now fascinated. And then the other ones which were skeptical in the beginning, which are now usually also very, yeah, uh, impressed and fascinated by what has happened. Do you feel that in Portugal there is uh, a bigger um, following? of these te this agroforest techniques or uh, comparing mm. to when you started coming here so the landscape in Portugal are... I do feel that since I have come here I think I came really in the right moment because since then there has been um, yeah I mean Portugal was always a bit special in the fact that um, there was already a lot of these kind of communities and permaculture things going on here. And um, so the people were already sensibilized to these subjects, or at least a certain part of the populace was sensibilized to these subjects. And now they're also open to hearing about the agroforestry concepts. And I feel that uh, since I've come to Portugal, I do see a growing interest in agroforestry. Now, I don't say this has anything to do with me, but in general, yeah. you know, there is a, uh, it's There's become a kind happening. of like a trend or a yeah. movement, yeah. There's a movement of people, I think, uh, we see, we're trying to connect a few dots of projects that are happening in Portugal. You can see them in the north and in the exactly. south. It's 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 very interesting to, to start building also, that. The drought in Alentejo is so strong and we're always speaking about, I don't know if it also gets more uh, aware of these kind of projects that we start not not disbelieving so much like the general popul uh, population but trying to get to know more. Uh, I don't know if, if in some way your project also gets this attention because it's quite amazing when you go there because mm. because it's green 
in the middle of Alentejo, in the middle of an area that is so, so yellow and drought. And, uh, and the monoculture also in that area. Uh, no. which, uh, um, what, so so you were, a while ago you were talking about like, um, so this is also learning, you were talking about uh, people that could go and do uh, some work with you. Mm. Uh, you you're talking about research, researchers going in there in, into the, into the, in, and spending some time with you. What, what well, is needed? This what has is needed? Uh, really had a lot of different structures throughout the past uh, years and months of how um, people have come here to participate in the project. And in the beginning, I was just very open to anybody that wanted to come and volunteer in any way or form. Could be like one day or two days or one day a week or maybe a week or... But then I started realizing that this doesn't really work out um, or it's not sustainable for me myself mm -hmm. because I explain things every day to somebody else and yeah. there's never somebody that stays a long enough time to where I can actually where they can see the place changing over a series of months and make their own conclusions from that. And so like where they see the results of their own work and actions. Yeah. And but, so but so I, I started then working with volunteers that would stay a minimum of six months here in the farm. And then um, there was one year where I had a lot of volunteers and it just really became a lot for me because I had five people living here with me for over six months and <laughs> it became a bit confusing and um, eventually it all kind of fell apart and I mean I'm still friends with all of them but um, in the end as I said it kind of fell apart and it also stressed me a lot being responsible for so many people that uh, I have now for over a year not uh, been receiving volunteers, you know, and uh, yeah. No, but my question was actually going to ask you if you like, if if the interest would be to partner with the universities. Uh, what, so that's like, the what one your... thing that so... I am still open towards is working with individuals that have a serious interest in learning this mm -hmm. and ideally that are connected to a university that gives it obliges them to follow a certain structure during their internship here and where they have a certain assignment that they have to complete by the end of their experience here so that it, um, they have this kind of obligation to, of discipline yeah. so to say and uh, that they are not just here for a holiday, you know, but um, yeah. um, that they are really coming here with set objectives. But what's holding me back from doing that really is also that I don't have space to host people. Um, if I wanted to do that, I would need to have a house somewhere where they could live and a kitchen where they could cook and uh, all these yeah. things. Yeah. You have kind of a small space in the middle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, for someone that doesn't know what is a agroforest or never seen a syntropic forest, mm. um, tell us a bit, what, you know, who are your neighbors, really neighbors, actually, the non-human ones? <laughs> what are you, how are you, what, what can we see? Like just a brief vision of what it means to be in that place. Yeah. Um, well, I can take you there real quick. <laughs> <laughs> Be a nice thing. Yeah. Look, um, so this here is a field that is now three, two and a half years old. And you can see that, um, I mean, at first sight, you see the eucalyptus trees on the top, which is mm -hmm. the one thing that stands out the most as it's very present and dominant at this point. Um, but then below you have a series of different trees of different species which are planted very very closely together and the idea is that there are these fast growing trees like the eucalyptus there's this tree here that you see coming up here which is called tagazaste they're very fast growing and they help to create 
the conditions that, for example, this tree, this uh, nettle tree, uh, Celtis australis, or the oak trees or the olive trees and the cypress trees, here's a peach tree, they create the conditions that these ones need in order to establish. And um, then there are certain moments of the year where now you can see this is very a closed canopy where there's not much light coming in. It's because we're at the end of summer when the sun is very, very strong. And up until a few days ago, if I would have opened this more, the plants below would dry out very fast. So it's helping the system retain its uh, humidity. But I, what I will come and do now in just a very few days is to radically prune all of these trees that are in the top like you can see here for example on this tree where I cut it just here in um, in February and then it grew all of this again now since then and this is something that I do two times every year and that is really what allows me in the end to have all of the uh, fruit trees underneath the forestry trees and have this all kind of uh, growing in harmony and in the very beginning like in the very first year what you would see in a place like this is obviously not the big trees but it's vegetables because they are giving that same protection that now the fast growing trees are giving to the fruit trees that are still establishing the vegetables were giving that same protection and that same kind of, um, yeah, that same environment to the fast growing trees so that they could establish themselves. And I mean, there's, I'm trying to explain this in a very simple way so that that's the way, could that's understand. the way, that's the yeah. way. We just wanted to in a very simple way. Yeah. And, uh, was that the tomatoes like, to, uh, that we tried? Uh. Uh, some of the the, the first uh, vegetables you were planting yes they were really good yeah, yeah. i remember yeah, of that of course <laughs> i mean the, everything like the idea is the following you know everything is information there is a, a qualitative aspect to everything which modern science does not acknowledge or is able to measure and this is like a cup of water is not equal to a cup of water and a radish is not equal to a radish and a tomato is not equal to a tomato. They are all different. And based on the intentions that the people that planted it and harvested it and took care of it had, as well as the environment that that plant grew in and how it felt during its lifetime reflects the qualitative aspects of said product. And now here, if a tomato plant lives here and its life's purpose is to improve this place mm -hmm. so that the next ones are able to establish themselves and live and occupy this place it is leaving it is at the end of its life cycle when you harvest it it does not consider itself as dying because it's living on in the next ones it's leaving a heritage of an improved soil and of all the species below that it helped to uh, establish. And that is then of course also reflected in the quality of uh, the produce that come from such a place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, uh, that, that is very interesting what you're saying because uh, you know, you, you seem to have uh, explained this that you have one of the bad guys that at the moment everyone, you know, the eucalyptus tree, which has been something that you know, because of the monoculture of this species now has a bad reputation. So explain me what does it mean to have eucalyptus? Because also there is, I imagine, and this is a question, and this is not a like a fact or something. There is a response, there might be a responsibility when you plant something, you know, if you, if you ever leave that place, what happens, you know, like whatever is the order you, you, you gave to something. Um, mm. Because at the moment you you you're kind of putting some not rules but like setting some some objectives to certain plants, right? Correct me if I'm wrong again. 
but of course, how does, uh, yeah. pretty much everything that I plant here has a specific objective associated to it. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, there's some species that I plant purely for the joy and curiosity aspect. But every single plantation in its core structure has a set set of species that do fill that space in its entirety in the different moments of the uh, establishment of that forest and uh, which tends or attempts to create a whole picture of all of them together. And um, then if I fail to intervene in specific moments when it would be necessary, of course, that image of what I initially intended this place to be changes. But that is not bad because everything in nature and in the universe is always changing. Mm -hmm. So we cannot say today is like that, tomorrow is like that. No, like mm. it's the day is like that, tomorrow is like that. But it's not the same today and tomorrow. And nature is just like that. Today the trees look like this and the sun looks like this. Tomorrow it has uh, different qualities and the light is different. And, you know, so... I mean, you know, like the way of its appearance, like the clouds are never the same and so on and so forth. And so, you see, yeah. there's nothing bad in nature. Nothing. Not a single thing that is bad. And you, when you attribute specific functions to all of these plants and you understand how they work together with one single objective, which is to improve the conditions of life for the next ones to come and for the ones that are there established together with them. None of them are doing this for themselves. They are doing it out of a collective purpose. You, well, you stop to blame a plant for doing that or doing that. And I mean, you see the problem with the monocultures of eucalyptus also is that they only plant eucalyptus and everything else that comes up they kill and then after some time because they plow the soil and because they put herbicides and because they fertilize it nothing else grows there but that's not because of the eucalyptus and here in this case i have planted in this field here that i'm standing in front of i've planted a total of 300 eucalyptus trees but there's over 12,000 other trees planted mm -hmm. below them yeah and yeah. so like, like Life even, is diversity, right? Even if I do leave this place and I never do anything here again, the eucalyptus trees will grow and they will get 10, 15, 20 meters tall. But everything else below it will continue to grow as well and they will continue to establish and grow as well. Mm -hmm. And the oak trees and many other trees that you see here in the surrounding landscape that are not able to make a straight stem growing below the eucalyptus they will make a straight stem and they will go directly up because they're protected yeah. how do you see how do you see the the future of quinta de zabalhas because um every every year is so different um at least for us when we see it it's so so different and also you're you're planting more area i think no you know, like in the beginning it was a smaller area and then you're increasing are you still plant planning on increasing more or how how what's your plans for for the place yeah, I mean, as I was saying earlier, my tendency is to scale up what I'm doing here. And uh, like the first field is two and a half thousand square meters. The second one was about 6,000 or 7,000 square meters. The third one was about 5,000. And now this year I'm doing uh, implementation all at once of one hectare, which right now I'm actually preparing. It's almost ready to be planted. It's going to be planted in almost in 10 days from now, I'm going to start planting it. There's going to be a group of 20 people that they're going to come and we're all going to collaborate on planting this together. And um, we're going to put about 25,000 trees within uh, one week yes. on that yes. field. And uh, as I said before, really my objective is to scale this up 
next year I would like to do an area of at least 10 hectares and then uh, move on from there to where I could maybe ha say that in five years from now I will have planted 250 hectares or something like that. Because um, I also see there is like a certain, I don't want to say urgency, but right now is the moment to do this, you know. And um, so I also feel a lot of drive and energy coming from this, uh, yeah, knowledge. Yeah, it's the right, uh, right time for sure. And also when we think about like the, the all the attention your project got in the beginning just has to increase is increasing uh, every year and it's also uh, when people see it one time and then again and you can yeah. see the difference it in a way it's also amazing and uh, it's so good that i think the workshops it's a good thing that we can replicate in other places the same and see the same same challenges and the same thing happening in other places Mm -hmm. yeah. so we normally ask um we have uh, something that is called like food for thought okay yeah. comida para pensamento and i know that you were putting you are here on the spot because we didn't uh, told you about this but um we just wanted some recommendations that we can share here with everyone that is listening or is going to listen mm -hmm. to it um any books any movies any uh, exercise, something that, you know, can be useful for us to take hmm. with us today. Um, useful or not useful, just something you want to give. <laughs> I mean, for me, I think um, one of the biggest, and the, this is something I would like to share, one of the biggest misconceptions for me or that I believe that people currently have about syntropic agriculture stems exactly from this name. And that is that it's only a form of agriculture. And in reality, I think when I speak with Ernst and when I, I mean, it has this very practical aspect to it and these very, you know, concrete principles that, uh, are very well explained and rationally perceivable. But I think that much more than that, it also has a big philosophical part to it that very little people um, study about or acknowledge or want to know about. And usually when you are, like let's say, um, a lot of times when I'm invited to these kind of conversations, I'll be explaining this part that I'm very passionate about, which is the philosophy. And they say, ah, no, no, but we don't have time to talk about philosophy here. We want to know about agriculture. And I think that, you know, anything you do in life without a philosophical and ethical background is, you know, it's, it's void of something that is so deep and has the potential to enrich whatever you're doing so much that I think this is really a shame. And for me, when I really started to understand what Ernst was trying to pass on to me was when I started reading about philosophy and specifically about the philosophical texts that he was always speaking about, about Platon, about uh, you know, Cicero and all these different, uh, Marcus Aurelius and all of these ancient uh, texts that have been left to us by people in past generations, hundreds and thousands of years ago, that still today have such a potential of enriching us and the way we see the world. Yeah. And would you, would you say, can you get, get dive in a bit more on that? Like what, what, what has your, you know, th those thoughts, those learnings changing in your life, for example, not to go very, you know, deep, but what was the I mean, most I like, I, I don't know. Much everything. I mean, like mm -hmm. sense of value and like what I want to do, what I don't want to do, discipline, uh, how I see myself placed here on this earth, what, how I relate with that. I relate with my plants, 
what how I see my work and I mean all of these things that has changed. It's mm -hmm. I mean it's uh, uh, like it's a uh, yeah it's something profound, you know. Because mm -hmm. you're you're originally from Germany. We we didn't spoke about that. You're not you're no. not Portuguese. No. So, yeah, this so knowledge is very it's also uh, very connected with uh, the way plants um connect with themselves different plants also mm. the the way they collaborate and they grow together this knowledge that you were speaking the, this ancient knowledge is uh, interesting how uh you brought this into the conversation because it's so much related to the whole community of, of plants, plants mm. and insects and birds that uh, uh, are there. Does the, the, the bees uh, are increasing there or not? Yeah, I mean, the, all the insects are increasing, also the birds that I have here and yeah, all of these things have increased, which is normal because they, they have more work to do here yeah. and so they have to come and work. Uh, thank, thank you thank yeah. you so much i think thank you also a... for the tour <laughs> of course <laughs> I think it, I mean, it's, great... to me it Sorry? feels more na natural to be here amongst the trees than uh, to be sitting down in my table yeah yeah we're quite jealous so uh <laughs> At the yeah. moment, we we try we've tried before like to do some talks and maybe that's something like mm. we we should think about it. But now it's like where I am is already getting really dark. So at this mm. time would be a uh, different experience. But this is something me and Elizabeth actually this these conversations between the two of us would happen sometimes like walking on the on the forest mm. park close by, uh, which was already quite nice. So no. yeah, I'm enjoying that looking at you and listening to you um, doing a, a motion, uh, uh, <laughs> <Very good. laughs> body motion. So yeah, thank you so much. Thank I you. hope everyone also enjoyed, took something uh, with our conversations. We um, we want to do more of it, um, and uh, yeah, let's see if we can keep a pace. And Mark, it's a pleasure. I hope we can go and visit you soon because, you know, yeah. we've been like every year around this time. Uh, it could be in a, in, a, in a time that you're planting trees and we're... Yeah, we, we saw... We can we visit talking. you and help uh, planting yeah. some trees. Exactly. Yeah, yeah we, were, we, were, we were talking about your hands on the other day because you said you shared a picture of your hands and, uh, you know... The, the, how the is starting the planting season yeah and uh, you know it's just it's just very interesting because it's really a it's a body's work you you are fully there so it's your mind is your body it's not you know it's not something you cannot that your body stays indifferent so that mean you don't need to go to the gym and you get stronger every day exactly exactly <laughs> yeah sure <laughs> yeah okay I mean, and also in that aspect, I think it's not really for everybody, but um, those that find joy in it, I think they really flourish within all of this. Yeah, but maybe just just being, isn't it? More time surrounded by uh, by the diversity of of life and and nature. That's already such a, at least, I think like most pe more people are talking about this. The ones that maybe were, you know, like. We live in the cities, me and Elizabeth, and yeah. and our our connection is not a daily connection, even though we try to spend more time outdoors as we can. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's just it's just just brings so much um, connection. So with ourselves too. So it, you know, you don't need to be planting, but just yeah, seeing it was great just to see your diversity, your neighbors. Uh, today, so thank you so much for that. Yeah, I think you can go. <laughs> I'll let you go. I'm gonna go plant some yes. trees. Well, maybe <laughs> not plant trees, but I'm gonna go be with my trees now. Yeah, yeah, okay. Thank, thank you. you. See you soon. Bye. Bye. See you later. Bye bye. See you later. Bye bye.